Thank you for tuning in to this very special episode of Back to the City. Today I'm joined by my good friend Mark. Hi. Who is responsible for Back to the City. <laughs> for the theme song. <laughs> for, for the, the theme, theme song. song. And the name. And the name Back to the, the City, which I stole city. from the song Minneapolis. Thank you for stealing. You're very welcome. Today we're going to take a dive into the happiness playlist. We're going to take a dive straight and I'm going to read a paragraph that introduces the premise. Okay. So it's October 2015 and a memory comes. On his one year birthday, my nephew stood wobbling in a circle of singing adults. He grinned so big, his cheeks forced the eyes closed. Love radiated and reflected back. Music was responsible. This raises a hypothesis. Will a steady diet of positive music keep me from the muck of sadness? An experiment has begun. I decide to listen exclusively to the happiness playlist. The length of the experiment is undetermined. If it works, maybe forever. So the length of your first book is determined, it's done. And the whole book is following you conducting this experiment. Yeah. Could you, first of all, in a nutshell, share the results of the experiment? That you can control to an extent your inside world through your outside world. Mm. So that you don't have to spend as much time as you think trying to change yourself. You can just use other tools. Mm -hmm. What kind of tools? Well, in this case, music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In this case, happy music. Is the experiment continuing still? If someone were to continue an experiment forever, that would suggest that they never came up with a conclusion mm. or mm. had any results. Are you conducting you know? a different experiment right now? Um, well, I'm writing another album right now. Every, each day is an experiment, right? Yes, absolutely. So maybe the broader idea of being able to control and create your reality outside of perhaps doing so through listening only to happy music. Is that broader experiment continuing? This is heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Heavy, abstract <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into Ask specifics. Ask me about like, my favorite ice cream. <laughs> Ice cream is in is in the book. Yeah, dogs, ice cream dogs is are in the, the book. book. Dogs, dog is in the book. A dog, dogs, dogs is an idea, and a dog Gilligan. is a specific dog, Gilligan. Yes, who yeah. I just visited like ten minutes ago. Really, I was hanging with him. We took a walk, and had some treats. Gilligan's a good dog. There's another dog which is told it's a good dog by you, oh, but yeah. it's not sure that it yeah, is. It looks away out in front of Walgreens. Yeah. And then it's, there's also Toto, who Toto. is not actually Toto, but Terry. Terry. Terry is the female dog who plays the role of Toto yeah. <laughs> in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As I learned from the book. Yeah. So yeah, it's not all abstract and heavy. There are dogs and there's loves. It's just what happened. And I wrote it down. Yeah. And then after it was written, I rewrote it. You mm -hmm. know, a lot, a lot like writing a demo, actually. The first draft was like a demo for a song. And then... You rewrite the demo and you rewrite the demo and and i wrote it a lot like one would write an album mm -hmm. how so when i realized i had enough to can make my point which was like six months worth of journaling mm -hmm. i broke them all up into individual stories because i was like how am i going to make a story out of this mm -hmm. and i thought and i thought well i'll just do it like i write albums and so i'll make because I can write, rewrite songs. I can rewrite demos. I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, if I take these 300 rough pages that were the first draft and break them down into a story and mm -hmm. every individual scene, mm -hmm. you know, story like scene in a movie maybe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gave it its own number. And then... Mm -hmm. I had all these separate numbers hmm. of things. Mm, I feel like there was 60, maybe 70 of them. Okay. And then every day or every four, three or four days, I worked every road every day. I would finish one of these little things. Did you do them in order? No, I started in the middle and then went to the end and then went to the beginning again. You know, I'll do that in songs too, where I'll write a song and then I'll I'll write like 10 verses to the song mm. and then I'll just kill the first five verses mm -hmm. and then I'll maybe move the last verse to the top just to be in the middle of the flow. When to be know. in the middle of the flow. I like the, yeah. the way that you put it. I didn't want to have the tone shift 
from the beginning to the end. I did eight, seven drafts. The editor did the eighth. Yeah. A couple of the big shifts were kind of whittling down the cast of characters yeah. so that it works better as a book. And then also it shifts. It's written in the present tense. Mm-hmm. So could you talk a little bit about either or both of those major revisions? I had a screenwriter friend in LA who mm-hmm. told me that before I wrote my screenplay a long time ago, this idea that a character in a sitcom only has one best friend. For the most part, the, that is an exception in this book. Some characters are combined to, you know, it's a small town. I want to protect everybody's identity. Sure, yes. That was the main, but mo- but that was very seldom. For the most part, I would just meet with people and have my phone on record mm-hmm. and record our conversations. I would take pictures of where we were so that when I came home, I could, you know, write, write out what it looked like and describe oh, yeah, the yeah. scene. One of the most amusing moments for me is uh, an interview. <laughs> I remember when we did that interview and I, I just uh, transcribed it edited out the parts, you know, that made everything a little more dense. Yes. It's a dense book, you know, mm-hmm. it is a, it, but it's e- an easy read. Yes. It's an easy read, but it's fast paced. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things that about switching the tense. That's nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was opposed to it at first, but then once I realized that it brought it to the moment, I, I was glad about that. Songs can be a recipe for joy and healing. The chord is the conscience of the lyric is something mm-hmm. that you said in that previous interview. And yeah, for that's, sure. That strikes me as really interesting. There's a couple of moments in the book as well when you say that music comes from the heart, not from the mouth. Could you expand a little bit more on either of those ideas? The idea of the chord being the conscience of the lyric and or of music coming from the heart, not the mouth? Yeah. There was this writer for Rolling Stone, uh, Kate Sullivan, she's super talented, and. She told me once that she felt that the bridge was the conscience of the song. Mm. I thought that was nice. And sometimes I employ that when I'm writing a song. So when I get to the bridge, I'm like, well, let's do a a second opinion. But I feel like uh, the chord can be the conscience of the lyric. Uh, in In the book, it's like happy birthday would be the example. If you're saying happy birthday in a minor key, it might seem sarcastic. Mm. There would be something incongruous, odd about it. <laughs> happy, you know, not, not happy. Yeah, contextually within our society mm-hmm. and within what we've conditioned ourselves to believe that the minor key is supposed to mean. One of the things that I find most interesting about the book is it really does treat the happiness playlist idea as an hypothesis to be tested. And there are a few moments when it is really pushed and and tested. For example, just after the interview we were talking about, uh, there's a discussion of gospel music. Something about gospel, when it's true, rings deeper than happiness. Right now we're conducting an experiment concerning the impact of listening to happy music. Mm -hmm. But then there's other music, which is great value, like gospel music, which taps into something beyond happiness. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? I think... Maybe if there was something that I, I, I really took with me in the exploration of happiness and how it relates to music when I was writing the book, mm-hmm. is that there's a place beyond happiness where happiness is used as a tool to reach a uh, place of spirituality or mm. a place of um, peace. Treating the happiness playlist experiment as a true experiment, one of the most intellectually interesting moments, I think, is when you ask, is the happiness playlist permitting joy or prohibiting emotion? You're starting to write happier music Mm -hmm. too by virtue of listening. Mm -hmm. So there's this loop happening. And then you step back from that and you think, okay, that's happening, it's permitting joy, but is it prohibiting other things? And then almost by accident, well actually by accident, you hear a song, Smoke Signals, Mm And that's not a happy song. Mm -mm. Could you talk a little bit about the significance of that experience within this experiment? Yeah, that that moment seems to strike people. When a song like Smoke Signals comes out, any songwriter would (laughs) 
drop their dishes and their jaw and go, wow, what a, what a poetic lyric. How powerful. It's yeah. a powerful poetic lyric. It's one of the best songs I've heard in a long time. Mm. And I didn't want to like develop a negative association with my happy music mm. by saying, setting rules. Mm -hmm. So I just let it happen. Mm. And that what, what I learned was, oh, I'm still happy. I listened to some sad song for a night and I'm still happy. Yeah. You Maybe know? there's some kind of gratitude to feel there you know, for the gift, whatever it is that the sad song enables to happen or taps into. Gratitude works, you know, for calming. Mm. Uh, every night before I go to bed, I think about uh, all the cool things that happened that day. Yeah, me too. You know, mm. hung out with the dog. I um could be did, wrote a fun song finished uh, an episode of the podcast or mm -hmm. went somewhere fun mm -hmm. it had some it could be something similar simple as like i had awesome pizza yeah. you know i list all those things and i like i feel better because in a way you're re-experience by thinking about meditating on those cool things that happen every day you're like re-experiencing them realizing your, your body's happened. yeah your body's like kind of going through yeah. that that good feeling and so in that way that gratefulness is an act, is like a meditative uh, act yeah there's one moment in the book when there's an account of you going to bed mm -hmm. and i'm in bed at 11 11 it says being in bed at 11 11 then you make a wish to spectral vortices the spell of prayer mm -hmm. So it gets quite, obviously, there's some spirituality. Yeah, mm -hmm, for sure. There's some spirituality to the root of music. The mm -hmm. beginning of music yes. is coming from communication yep. or for spiritual reasons. Yes. You know? In the prayer, you pray love continues on its exponential path. I pray that we aren't living in a computer simulation, which made me, you know, a moment ago you were saying, if we exist. Yeah. Um, I pray that if we are living in a computer simulation, the afterlife is included. <laughs> that was a, I, I, it was just, I mean, it's, that's been a real calming revelation for me. Because hmm. um, I, I, there is a part of me that does believe we're living in a computer simulation. Mm -hmm. And that can, that's depressing. But then if you think, well, a computer could ge have generated this infinite existence for us that yes. we could be experiencing for eons, <laughs> then that's okay. <laughs> What's so bad? Yeah. Unless it's torturous, unless it's an experiment. Well, if the happiness playlist experiment works, then it seems like it's a pretty benevolent computer program. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the big bad wolf seems benevolent in grandmother's clothing. What if the big bad wolf is exactly what Little Red Riding Hood needs to experience and confront to be able to grow? And therefore, the big bad wolf is part of this benevolent program. Does she kill the big bad wolf still? Is Perhaps. that how she grows? She grows through confronting this thing that isn't grandma, that isn't comfortable. And you're saying, what if that's written in the computer program? Yeah. What if the universe or the computer program of God gifts Little Red Riding Hood with the big bad wolf so that she can grow? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, I suppose if we're living in a computer simulation that fairy tales are, were generated as well. Yeah. Uh, or like our big bad wolves, the things that seem bad to okay. us. When we have bad experiences from sure. which we grow. Sure. Right at the end, mm -hmm. it says, music is a story. In the best stories, a couple falls in love and nothing goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that in the best stories, nothing goes wrong? In this story, we, there's a love interest, but by the end of the prologue, that relationship is done. And no, the relationship's not done. Exactly, well, the romantic relationship. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the most beautiful things about the book is that the relationship is not done, that mm -hmm. it's a story about a man and a woman being friends. Yeah. And especially a man and a woman being friends after there having been the, the possibility or the reality of a romance. That's a better story, I think, than where a couple falls in romantic love and nothing goes 
Yeah, I don't, I don't really agree with this idea of conflict within a narrative. And in screenwriting, it's like mm. essential. There must always be conflict. Mm. Hate your hero. You know, you have to constantly make it harder for your main character. But yeah. I kind of think the, 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 the Wizard of Oz would be a cool movie if there was no witch. And if they just kept going through this forest. <laughs> if it was just Toto looking off screen all the time. Yeah, right. Or, like, like what, if, what if Alice in Wonderland, there was no queen and Alice just like met friends and they had a great time. <laughs> I would be fine with that. And maybe yeah. there were backflashes to some times that were, that were difficult in the past. N- which, see, I'm saying, I'm saying, not even a, a, I'm saying a story, uh, a narrative that's a, that's a guided meditation that you mm. can just go to a movie theater, see people being happy and doing awesome things and then the movie and then like why does a couple fall in love with a movie and then a, a conversation on the phone is misheard and then they they almost break up and get back together why can't a couple just meet each other in a movie and then have a great time why does there need to be conflict in a story mm. why can't a story just be if there was a flower it grew beautiful and we looked at it all the time in the yard <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that if a, if a story can be a guided meditation, yes, um, for those two hours we won't experience conflict. Sure, it was part of the intention in this book to have a lot of times in the book that are relaxing to read, mm. you know, a calm to read, so that not only can someone read about happiness, but the book is funny intentionally. Experience happiness, then. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So it's and not just a kind of solipsistic, I can make myself more happy, let's do this. It's more like, I'm experiencing the results of this experiment. How can I share them? I would say that the book... Uh, <laughs> took a long time to write. I'm happy it's over, but I'm also happy it's completed. And I hope that, uh, my hope for the book is that everyone who reads it um, feels awesome or, or feels like, feels something, you know, mm. and, and the story is, uh, resonates throughout the universe. And uh, I believe that something like that will happen because it was a true experiment, not a conventional like scientific experiment, but you felt the results. What happens when we feed through our, through our heart, through our gut, if we feed these emotions, yeah. we get in a kind of a loop of, of those emotions, what happens? We experience happiness. We, we discover that some seemingly unsolvable things are solvable after yeah. all. And, and some unsolvable things are not solvable. Yes. And there comes a point when you have to just go, I'm not going to try and solve this anymore. And just accept it Mm. yeah like the fact that we are the aliens (laughs) which is the plot twist of my next book revealed in the very beginning and at the very end of this interview Mm -hmm. which is what has just occurred thank you very much (laughs) thank you for coming in yeah and um i look forward to the next record and hopefully to the next book yeah whatever the universe um unfolds into when <laughs> when the millions of dollars arrive <laughs> this is before i'll write a million books way, for yes. every dollar uh, every million i'll write a book for every dollar i, I make <laughs> better get started <laughs> <laughs> cool okay well i've been simon calder this is mark mormon uh, this has been back to the city and we will see you at we'll see you uh, we'll see you about <laughs>